Okay, I want to uh, welcome everyone back um, to our Zoom Bible study. Uh, we are currently doing a uh, major doctrinal um, survey, surveying the major doctrine of the Bible. Uh, we're currently looking at the doctrine of future things, the doctrine of future things. Uh, we're looking at uh, prophecy, uh, unfulfilled prophecy, uh, prophecy still yet to be fulfilled. And uh, we're kind of like uh, close to the end um, of this uh, study. Uh, we're now in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. Uh, we did not do a in-depth study um, of Revelation. Uh, this is a survey. So we surveyed uh, anything related uh, to unfulfilled prophecy, but in a survey form, not an in-depth uh, word for word from the original language type study. We just kind of survey it. So uh, we're not going to get into all the details. Sometimes it's tempting to uh, look at a lot of detail and it go longer than I expected. Uh, but uh, let's get started. Before we get started, let's spend a few moments of silent prayer. Uh, this is so that everyone will exercise the privacy of their priesthood. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you represent yourself before God. Whenever you sin, you don't need a priest, a human priest, to uh, go to God on your behalf, offering uh, sacrifices for sin. Jesus Christ has already offered the sacrifice himself. And all we need to do to restore fellowship with God and commune with God is to confess our sin. And we can go ourselves to the throne of grace, to find mercy and grace to help us in time of need. Because Christ has already died, he is our high priest, and he's now interceding for us at the right hand of God the Father. So let's take a few moments of silent prayer to give everyone the opportunity to confess any sin that you may have committed, mental sin, verbal sin, or action sin. All sin is against God and take us out of fellowship. But all we have to do is confess and the Bible, uh, the Bible tells us God is faithful and just to forgive us and clean us from all unrighteousness. So with that being said, let's spend a few moments of silent prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we bow before your throne of grace to find mercy and grace to help us in time of need. We are in need of cleansing in. Uh, we all sin uh, after salvation as believers in Jesus Christ, but thank you uh, for your love for us that do not fail even though we fail, and we ask you to clean us from all sins so that we can be able to fellowship with you, but also be able to commune with you as we study your word. Uh, thank you for those who are here. May you bless them, honor them as they have honored you this morning. I mean, this evening, sorry. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so that should tell you uh, that I have been going, going, going uh, since this morning. And uh, and so I'm still thinking this morning. <laughs> so, all right, so let's go to uh, Revelation uh, 19. Revelation, Revelation 19. Uh, some of you wasn't uh, with us when we uh, did chapter 17 and chapter 18 and chapter 17 and 18. Uh, we looked at um, uh, the fall of uh, Babylon uh, and also the fall of the religious system during the tribulation. So we're at the end of the tribulation period. So chapter 17 and chapter 18 is uh, uh, the end, uh, the near the end of the tribulation um, period where uh, uh, we see uh, the Antichrist have made his uh, uh, center of government and also his religious system in Babylon. Babylon was an ancient city uh, and this uh, ancient uh, city was the center or the beginning of idol worship or idolatry or a false religion. And during the tribulation period, the Antichrist 
who's going to come out of the revived Roman Empire, is going to make his headquarter in uh, this ancient city by the name Babylon. And during this time of the tribulation period, Babylon is going to be the commercial center uh, of the world, uh, uh, the, the, the center of the one world um, government, one world commerce, uh, and also the one world religion. A lot of the things that we uh, uh, hear and see with United Nations, with all this terminology of one world government, we all serve in the same God, one world religion is all just paving the way uh, for this one world religion uh, during the uh, um, end of, during this near this end of the uh, tribulation uh, period. And so, but Babylon will come to an end. So let's just do a, a quick uh, recap of chapter 17 and 18. We're not going to spend a lot of time just going to jump jump around and then we'll pick up with chapter uh, 19. All right, so let's start at verse one of chapter 17, Revelation 17, um, chapter uh, uh, verse one. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Now, a harlot, a harlot is, is someone uh, who are committing sexual um, sins, someone who are committing a sexual sin. But in this context, a harlot is more than someone uh, who is committing sexual sin. A harlot is someone who is uh, have uh, uh, substituted God for false religion or for idol worship. Someone who have substituted the one true God for idols or idol worship. And so here we see judgment is coming on the harlot who sits on many waters. Uh, uh, see, prostitution, spiritual prostitution is when men forsaken the one true God for idol worship or false religion. In verse two, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immortality. And so immorality. So here we see that during this period of the tribulation per uh, period, uh, the world or the mass of mankind is going to buy in to the philosophy of a one world government, but also a one world religion uh, or, 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 or uh, forsake um, the one true God for idolatry or the worship of I, uh, um, um, idols. Um, um, and then verse three, and he carried me away into the spirit, into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous name, having seven heads and 10 uh, horns. Um, and here, uh, this seven head and 10 horns is uh, a, a representation of the close union between the political and the re religious system um, of the Antichrist under the seven heads and these 10 horns. And so the kings of the earth is going to fornicate with the Antichrist and buy in to the one world government and the one world religious system. And then it say the woman was clothed with purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stone and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abomination and of the unclean things of her immortality. So here we see that the uh, uh, um, the Antichrist uh, kingdom uh, of government will be uh, very prosperous during uh, this time. Uh, the woman was clothed in purple, scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stone. With this is a reference to prosperity during uh, this uh, time. And then verse five, and on her forehead a name written, a mystery, Babylon the Great the mother of harlots. And so Babylon is said to be the mother of harlots. In other words, 
Babylon is where false religion or religion or idol worship originated. That's why uh, Babylon is called the mother of harlot because Babylon was the origination of false worship or idol worship. Um, if you remember, Abraham was brought out of this area uh, in Ur of the Chaldean and, uh, and he was snatched out of a pagan idolatrous um, society uh, to form uh, the nation we know as Israel. God formed Israel out of Abraham's descendant when he set Abraham apart. Verse 6 says, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her which has the seven heads and ten horns. Now, the seven uh, head is the uh, seven uh, rulers, uh, ten horn, uh, uh, ten kingdoms, uh, the beast that you saw and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. And here is the mind which has wisdom, the seven heads or the seven mountains on which the woman uh, six, sits. Uh, uh, and so these seven mountain, seven heads is the rulers. Um, uh, and then the, 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 the seven mountains is their kingdoms. This is kind of like the United Nations of this time. And they are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain a little while. Um, and then the beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. Uh, so here we see uh, uh, the... Uh, the beast, which is the Antichrist or, or the world ruler during this time. And then verse 12, the ten horn which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received the kingdom, but they receive authority as king with the beast for one hour. So the, 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 the Antichrist actually came out of, of the, the ranks um, of these other kings. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. So here we see that the uh, kings of the earth and the world rulers during this time are going to uh, uh, give a, 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 a make alliance um, with the Antichrist, because they say that um, they give their power and authority to the beast. And so uh, here, these rulers during the this period of the tribulation are going to align or give allegiance to the antichrist but verse 14 say these will wage war against the lamb and the lamb will overcome them because he is the lord of lords and king of kings and those who are with him and the called and chosen and the faithful and he said to me the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitude and nations and tongues. So all nations during this time is going to embrace the religious system and the one world trade system of the Antichrist. It's going to be a one world government and the beast is going to be over all people because there's going to be a one political uh, uh, system and, uh, and, all, and most men are going to buy in so this one world uh, religion, they're going to replace the one true God for uh, the worship of the Antichrist. Verse 17, for God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. The woman whom you saw is the great city where reigns over the kings of the earth. So Babylon will be the commercial center of the world. 
the Antichrist will, uh, it will be his commercial uh, and religious headquarter. And it's going to be a really prosperous city uh, during this time. Uh, uh, people are going to be making a lot of money because you're going to have uh, uh, one world, a uh, one world economy, one world trade and, and a one world religion. And then we see in chapter 18 that Babylon is going to fall and be no more. In other words, there will be no rival worship uh, because God will judge Babylon uh, for her harlotry and worship of the Antichrist. And that's what we have in chapter 18. Um, is verse 1 of chapter 18 say. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having a great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried out with a loud voice. I mean, with a voice saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. So here we see during this time that so much demonic activity is going to be in Babylon. Why? Because Babylon is the center for uh, uh, idolatrous worship. And wherever, wherever there is idolatry, there's demons. And so all nations, all people are going to flock uh, um, to Babylon uh, where the one world religion and uh, uh, one world government will be headquartered uh, in this uh, Babylon of the tribulation. And so it say that the demons have made their home there during this time. Verse three say, for all the nation have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. So here we see that men who have bought into this one world government, this uh, uh, one world religion, going to be very prosperous during this time under the leadership of the Antichrist and the false prophet. They're going to um, be very prosperous. In verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come. Out from her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sin and receive her plague. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquity. And so how, now uh, uh, God is about to uh, pay back uh, uh, in his justice um, this uh, idolatrous sinner for how the sinner have treated uh, true believers or tribulation, uh, tribulational saints. And so Babylon will be brought to an end. And that's what we have in chapter 17 is the destruction of the commercial uh, and religious system um, of the Antichrist in the one in, during, during this uh, during this period. All right, so that's chapter that's chapter eighteen. So I'm, I'm not going to keep on reading, uh, but now let's go to chapter nineteen, and we'll look at um, some new some new um, uh, material now. So um, so uh, now in chapter nineteen, starting at verse one, after the destruction of Babylon, and uh, uh, um, there will be a reaction uh, in heaven to the destruction of Babylon. And let's look at this reaction in heaven at the destruction of Babylon uh, at this period of the tribulation. So we'll start with verse one. After these things, and what, it, what, what do John mean when he say after uh, these things? Well, after the destruction of Babylon, the uh, uh, one world government center in the one world religious system during that time. After these things, 
I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belongs to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bond servants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bond servant, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. So here we see a multitude roaring in heaven. Uh, 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 and now who is this multitude that is roaring in heaven at, at the after the destruction of the Antichrist system of government and the Antichrist uh, religious idolatrous system? Uh, who is this roaring? Well, this could be the well, the church, first of all, is already in heaven, have already been raptured before the tribulation actually started. And so the church will be amongst this multitude that is ruined at the destruction um, of Babylon. But also, um, uh, there may be angels also ruined, angels and Old Testament believers, and Old Testament believers. And notice they are praising God here uh, um, because of salvation, glory, and power belongs to him. And so in verse 5, they give praise to God, and then it says uh, salvation uh, in verse, uh, in verse uh, 1, Salvation, glory, and power belongs to our God. Now, when we think about salvation, uh, we think about deliverance. When we think about glory, God's glory, one of the reasons he's being prayed, we should think of how he deal with sin. He judges sin. That's his glory. Because his judgment revealed his character, his righteous standard which is his glory. His character is his glory. And so he is being praised uh, uh, for his deliverance, for his judgment. But also he's being praised in verse one for his power. Power belongs to him. In other words, God has the ability to uh, uh, judge his enemies and also overcome his enemy. And that's what we uh, that's what the text means about uh, his power, is that he has the ability to overcome his enemies because he has inherent power. He has power. All right, so and, and those who praise God in heaven, uh, they uh, proclaim the truth that God has destroyed the one world uh, 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 prostitute, which is the one world harlot, and uh, Babylon is called the harlot because of her religious system. The religious system, that system that worship idols, that worship the Antichrist, that worship a false Christ, that worship a false ruler, a person who had promised to bring peace to the world but it was a false sense of peace. It's false peace. Only Jesus Christ can bring peace as the true uh, Messiah. Uh, so this should encourage even us as church age believer that a time may be coming where we're going to be persecuted. And believers are in other countries, believers are already being killed for their faith. But vengeance is coming. 
as we see here, that God would not allow the wicked and those who reject Christ to get away with sin forever. He will repay them, as we see. Those who treat his people badly. See, we can sleep like a baby knowing that if someone treat us badly, God will repay them. He will repay them. Everybody that harmed God's people will be repaid, just like Babylon is being repaid, or oh, God repaid Babylon for what she did to his people in uh, chapter 18. All right, so, uh, and now we go down, go down back, back to verse three, we see uh, her smoke rises up forever and ever. So Babylon's smoke rises up forever and ever. What does this what does this mean? Babylon smoke rise up forever and ever. Well, this speaks of eternal judgment. Eternal judgment. So Babylon will experience everlasting destruction, never to rise again. Never to rise again. This would be a eternal burning or a eternal um, destruction. Uh, um, now, we go now to verse, uh, let's go to verse four. Let's go to verse four. Verse four, and the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne. You know, and so here, uh, uh, um, the believers and the four living creatures fall down and worship God. Uh, um, the elders and the living creature fall down um, to worship. And then in verse five, again, in verse five, um, we see that the, the father and the son both uh, will be on the throne because here, um, give praise to God and, and all his bonds who fear him, the small and the great. And as we read on, we, we, will, we know that Jesus Christ will reign um, as King of King and Lord and Lord. So God the Father and God the Son will both reign. The Son is at the right hand of God the Father. And uh, so both are reigning on the throne. All right. So let's go to verse, let's go to verse seven, because here we see something taking place in heaven called the marriage supper of the lamb or the marriage of the lamb now in the tribulation the one world government and the one world religious system will be the wife of the antichrist also the church is the bride of jesus christ See, the Antichrist has his bride, and his bride is false religion. Whereas Christ has his bride, which is the church. The church. The center for word, the, the, the center for false religion for the bride of the Antichrist will be Babylon. During this time. Jerusalem, the Jews' headquarter will be Jerusalem. The church in the future will be in the new Jerusalem. The bride of Christ will be in the new Jerusalem. So now let's look at the uh, response uh, to the invitation of the verse we just uh, read. All right, so now we see, let us, I'm uh, sorry, let's go to verse seven. Verse seven, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saint. So here we see the a beautiful day uh, in heaven. And the reason why this is a beautiful day in heaven, uh, uh, 
is that the lamb and his church is being joined in marriage. The lamb uh, 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 um, will marry his church, the bride of Christ. And so the servants of the Lord is rejoicing, giving God uh, a glory because they are anticipating this great event called the marriage supper uh, of the Lamb. Now, uh, 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 now this uh, event, the marriage of the Lamb to his bride, the church, is going to take place after Babylon uh, is destroyed near the end of the tribulation uh, uh, period. All right, so here we see a special union between Jesus Christ and his church. And this special union between Jesus Christ and his church is a picture of a bridegroom and a bride union in marriage. The two become one. So Jesus is coming back to this earth where he and his bride will reign together as one. I'm looking forward to that day. But before they can reign together, they had to be married. Uh, they had to be married. Now, this idea of being Jesus being joined together uh, with the uh, um, uh, um, the church just brings out a that there's a special relationship that exists during this period with Jesus and the church would make the church fit to reign with him, if the church is his bride and have joined in marriage, then the church can participate as he reign um, here on earth. Um, so as, as Christians, I just want to give uh, you a charge because all this is going to happen. And, uh, and we need to be ready for these events to happen. You know, uh, uh, as we read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, we will be taken up as the church, Jew and Gentile, will be taken up at the rapture. And after the rapture, who remember what's going to happen once we're raptured before the tribulation starts? What's going to happen next in heaven? Right after the rapture, what's going to happen next in heaven? Heaven while the Antichrist is coming on the scene here on earth, what's going to happen in heaven immediately after the rapture? Anybody remember? Do anybody remember what event going to take place once we're taken out of the earth immediately after the rapture? The judgment seat of Christ. All right, good. The judgment seat of Christ. So we'll go before the judgment seat of Christ, which tells you that we need to be getting ready and getting prepared through spiritual maturity because it could happen any day. You know, we may be living amongst the last generation. You know, the way things are looking, we may be the last generation. Uh, uh, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12 through 15. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. Verse 12 say, Now if any man builds on the foundation, and the foundation is Christ, salvation, with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hair, and straw, each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. So notice here, or let me read on. If any man's work, which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer law, but he himself will be saved yet. So as through fire, do you not know that, you are a temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you. 
If any man destroy the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy. And that is what you, that is what you are. Let no one deceive himself. If any man among you think that he is wise in his age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. So here what we see is that every believer, every believer's works will be tested by fire. And what is being tested? Not the quantity of work, but the quality of one's work as a Christian. See, you can work for Christ and do good works and be in the flesh while you're doing it, you would not get rewarded for anything you do while you were controlled by the sin nature. You actually lose rewards. And so it's not how much work you do, it's what is the quality of your work. In other words, how much work you do under the influence of the Holy Spirit. How much work you do while you're uh, uh, in fellowship with God, you're going to be rewarded for that work. Every believer is going to be rewarded for that work. That is the, and words that we do out of fellowship is called wood, hay, and straw. Words we do in fellowship is called good, silver, and precious stone. Why? Because God is the one performing this work in us and through us through his spirit when we are in fellowship. So we get rewarded for what we allow God to do in us and through us while we're in fellowship with God. Now, so, so this is another reason we should get ready. Now go to 2 Corinthians 5.10. 2 Corinthians 5.10. 2 Corinthians 5.10. Verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So here we see that we all are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And that's going to happen the moment you, the moment, um, the moment the rap of the rapture. All right, so now we'll go to, go. let's go back to Chapter 19 in Revelation, verse 7. So at the rapture, we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be rewarded for the quality of our work. How much work did you do while you was in fellowship with God, controlled by the Holy Spirit? All right, in chapter 19, um, again, um, we all will attend the marriage and the, mar the marriage supper of the Lamb. Um, so let's go to verse 7. Let me get back there. Verse 7. Um, well, actually, let's go to verse uh, 9. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that's all believers, the saints. They're the ones who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. Then I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony in Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So be be uh, before uh, the marriage, the church will wear fine linen. Uh, which is their righteous acts. So the, the fine linen of verse eight uh, is the deed that believers do while they're in fellowship uh, with God. That is the deed that is considered to be fine linen. So our deeds and what we do now will follow us to heaven. And those deeds we do will, uh, uh, will um, uh, be worn like a gown or a robe called fine linen in verse, uh, in verse 8. Now, what makes this possible? Our faith in the Lamb of God. 
Jesus Christ. And because it's through his work and faith in him that we're made clean and bright, positionally, when God gives us Christ's perfect righteousness as a gift. But in our practice, we need to practice righteousness while we're in fellowship, and we will get rewarded for that righteousness as, as well. All right, so uh, so the uh, verse... So the bride's uh, righteousness um, is different from the mother of harlots. So the Antichrist and those who follow the Antichrist, those who accept his religious system during the tribulation have a false righteousness because they have false religion. They have false religion, so they have false righteousness. Only the believer in Jesus Christ have true righteousness, which God gives to those who believe. But also the, the bride have been made ready. But we saw earlier that the, the harlot uh, uh, was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of of uh, those who died for their faith in Jesus Christ. All right. Now we go to uh, we go to uh, 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 what is it? Matthew. I think it's in Matthew. In Matthew eight. So let's go to Matthew eight, and we we'll see a, a Jesus. Uh, um, kind of help us better understand this marriage supper of the Lamb when he was on earth, when he spoke in Matthew 8. So let's go to Matthew 8. And let's look at the, the parable. There's two parables I wanted us to, to look at today. And that's the parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the wedding banquet. The parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the wedding banquet since we're talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. So you are blessed if you are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. All right. So let's start at verse uh, Matthew 8, verse uh, 12. Yeah, let's look at verse verse twelve. All right, verse. Let let's let's go to. Uh uh uh. uh well, that's not the one I'm looking for. Give me one second. I'm sorry. Let me. Is that the one I'm looking for? Nope, that's not the one. I'm looking for the parable of the ten virgins. Parable of the ten virgins. Y'all remember I had it written down. The ten virgins would be in Matthew 25. 25. Let's go to 25, y'all. Thank you, Becky. Yep, there it is. There's the ten virgins. All right. So uh, Matthew 25. Uh, let's start with verse um, 1. Can I get a volunteer to read, please? 25 verse 1. And I, let's go to verse 13. 1 through 13. Any volunteers? Yeah, I'll go. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. 
But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will, be, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some of your, for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Amen. So here we see some prepared uh, 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 for the coming of the Messiah, the bridegroom. And this is a reference to the church uh, uh, being prepared or believers being prepared uh, because they have trusted in Christ as their Savior. So just as the ten virgins uh, who, are, who represent people, heard the bridegroom, who is Jesus, and his bride, the church, were coming back for their banquet. So too, our Lord Jesus Christ will come back, which we're looking at now in, Matthew, in uh, Revelation 19. He will come back with his church at the end of the tribulation period, and the marriage supper of the Lamb will be conducted during that time. And only those who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior, only those who uh, have been sealed with the Holy Spirit will be allowed to attend the banquet on earth. And so now we go to another one, Matthew 22, the parable of the wedding banquet. Now remember, when Jesus used parables, he is actually... Uh, uh, have turned his back on unbelievers. Uh, and, and, and this other pair, the, the wedding fee, is all about how the kingdom of God is open to everyone, not only to the Jews. Uh, and that's what the church age is all about, is that God offering salvation to Jew and Gentile. But even though they offer it to Jew and Gentile, only those who believe, will actually enter the kingdom age where Jesus is bringing back and be able to uh, uh, celebrate uh, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. All right, Matthew 22, verse 1. Matthew 22, 1, Jesus spoke to them again a parable. Now, parable is used to hide truth from unbelievers because they have already uh, rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior and therefore, they are condemned. So Jesus really is condemning Jewish unbelievers when he used this parable, parable of the marriage feast and when he, when he used the parable of the ten um, virgin. Uh, Jesus spoke to them again in parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatted livestock and all butchered and everything is ready, come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. For the king was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slave, the wedding is ready for those who were invited were not worthy. So the ones who were not worthy, those Pharisees and religious leaders, and they're going to be the same way during the, the tribulation period is all these religious people who are part of the Antichrist false religion, they were invited, but they uh, were not worthy. 
Uh, go therefore to the uh, to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. This is a picture of God offering salvation to everyone who will come, to all men, not just Jews, but also Gentiles as well. Go therefore to the main highway, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, in the wedding hall were filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servant, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place, there should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But men are called, but few are chosen. You know, I thought about, when I looked at this, I thought about how during the tribulation period, right before Babylon get judged, people are going to have a, uh, they're going to accept this false uh, religion, therefore a false righteousness or a false sense of security. See, religion brings a false sense of security to those who are religious. And so they think that they're right with God, the false God, the Antichrist. They think they're right with God, but they would not be at the wedding feast. They would not go into the kingdom age because they have false religion. They don't have the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Therefore, they would not be invited well, they, they was invited to the wedding feast, but they would not be able to come into the banquet. They would not be able to come. They were invited, but they won't be able to come in. So God prepared a wedding feast for his son, Jesus Christ. He sent out invitations through the gospel, through the angels, through the prophets. And many unbelievers made excuses for not attending. So he invited us, the church. Uh, the unbeliever was not wearing the right kind of wedding uh, 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 apparel, meaning were not wearing the fine linen of Christ's righteousness or the kind of righteousness that is needed to attend the banquet, the God type of righteousness to accept in Jesus as Savior. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. See, that's the fine linen. And you got to have that fine linen in order to enter the kingdom or the banquet. You got to have God's righteousness and not your own righteousness through false religion. And so this person will be escorted out of the banquet uh, because he did not have the righteousness that he needed to be accepted by God. Only Jesus can give man that righteousness. Nobody can go to heaven uh, uh, without the righteousness of God through Christ. They must be properly dressed. All right, so uh, let's go back and then we'll close in prayer. Let's go back to let's go back to Revelation 19. And we'll close with uh before you know with verse uh so we see in verse 10 the blessing uh blessing on the guests at this suffer uh, uh, uh this supper. Um uh and then um some some I, I must say this some people believe this banquet will be in heaven and some believe that it will be on earth. Uh, and but it does seem as if um, the wedded feast uh, would take place on earth uh, at the beginning of the millennium kingdom. It does seem as the context seemed to indicate that. Um, but verse 11 indicate that it may take place in heaven. Uh, and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness 
he judges and wages war. So it seemed as if the, uh, the, the marriage supper of the lamb would take place in heaven, but there are some who believe it would take place uh, on earth. So, uh, so after the angel, uh, um, 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 after John, John said after he wrote, uh, after he wrote what the angel was telling him, uh, here he said he fell at the angel's feet to worship him, uh, and the angel said, "Hey, stop doing that. You know, I'm just your servant. Just let you know that we're not to worship angels. We're to worship Christ and not angels. That's another." You know, man always have that tendency to worship something else other than God. And, and during the tribulation period, everybody, most of everybody, will worship Satan and his Antichrist. Why? Because the false prophet would demand uh, uh, the worship of the Antichrist. See, worship of anyone other than God is uh, uh, forbidden. Um, and, and John and, and the angel here say, hey, don't worship me. All right. So we see Christ coming here in verse 11, um, back to the earth to set up, set up the millennium kingdom. But before you do, uh, he's going to judge the beast and the false prophet. So when we come back. We'll look at the coming of Christ and the judgment of the Antichrist and the false prophet. The Antichrist and the false prophet, they are the leaders of the one world government and the one world religion. They're the ones who have uh, uh, turned men away from worshiping the true God to worshiping idols or someone else or something else. And therefore they're about to be judged. When we come back, we'll look at uh, judgment on the, uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet. Any questions or comments? Before we close in prayer, any questions or comments? Anybody? I remember the first time I heard the Ten Virgins story oh, years and years ago. I always thought, well, that wasn't very nice of the five ones that had oil not to share. But then my sister explained to me, no, that's salvation. You can't share your salvation. Right. So that made sense, that oil. Yes, exactly. Yep. Yeah. They all, they all got to make a choice. All right, so we come back. We'll get into the, uh, the climax of the entire Bible, and that is with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's start right here. Father, we're so thankful for all you have done for us in grace. Uh, thank you for saving us. Um, and, and, and all we could do for unbelievers is share the gospel. We can't give up our salvation so that they may be saved. Paul wanted to do it. Paul said, I would give up my salvation for Israel to be saved. But everybody must make a choice. And we pray uh, for our family and our friend that they all will come to know Jesus as their Savior uh, before the rapture. Uh, and we pray that you will just help us see the importance of sharing our faith uh, because we want all of our loved ones and our friends to be at this banquet uh, of uh, this marriage supper uh, of the Lamb and his church. And so we ask you to save our loved one and our friends and those we know and give us a word to speak to them as we seek to share the gospel. Keep our minds and heart until we meet again. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. Hi, oh, you're welcome. Thank you for joining in, everybody. God bless. Amen. Thanks, right. Pastor. You're welcome. See you, Brian.